So this next point is for all the houseplant people and the container gardeners. You absolutely must listen to this because this is so important. Hello plant people. How are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we are starting a new series and the series is going to be back to back 17 days all the way to Christmas. And it's all about the 17 essential essential plant nutrients that your plants need to survive and thrive both indoors and outside. So I'm going to be going over what the nutrient is, how it works in the soil, how it works in the plant, how to apply more, what can cause it to be limited within your soil system. And I'm going to apply it both to house plants. So I'm going to say soil less medium, meaning potting soil, LECA, sphagnum moss, coconut coir. When I refer to that and the situation with that and that nutrient, it's going to apply to houseplant and container gardeners. And then when I say soil or um, gardeners outdoors, it's going to refer to the gardeners. So these, I guess, videos is literally 17 days. It's like my knockoff of Vlogmas, but the plant version of it because we deserve a, a Vlogmas as well, but a plant, a plant uh, version of it. So 17 days, literally back to back, I'm going to be here. I expect you guys to also be here, hopefully, if not, huge flop. But if it is a success, then I will do this every year. So next year I was thinking we could do 17 days of, or probably more, I'd probably be closer to 30 days of um, microbes, for example. And the reason why this is so convenient for me is because the winter time, both for my day job and my hobby are pretty boring. Like I just do my houseplant stuff and I'm starting to do some indoor gardening stuff for the YouTubes. But other than that, I don't have a ton of stuff to do. So it's not a huge inconvenience for me and it's a really great way to get you guys information in really tiny bite-sized pieces. So let's get started. Oh, wait, first, these have officially come in, you guys. You can still get the PDF copy if you're like a good notes, paper-free person. Those are on the Etsy store, but these are on Amazon and they're paperbacks. Uh, both of them are hundred pages. Now the content in both is different. So this one has different content compared to this one here. So just an FYI, if you guys want me to combine the two, let me know. The only thing I'm not sure about is I think I'm limited to only 100 pages. So I would have to get rid of, I think the, I think I put 56 weeks, a little over a year of the weekly planners in here. So I wouldn't be able to do like the weekly planner portion because the first literal like 50 some pages is all um, workbook material for both the soil, indoor and outdoor soil and then the seeds and plant care. So if you guys want me to combine the two, let me know. I can do my best to try. The only thing I'm concerned about is I would have to remove the weeklies on the back. But if you want to support the channel, this is a great place to start. Uh, plus it's all science-based material, so it will not lead you astray. This is literally going to set you guys up to be like soil pros for lack of a better term you guys are going to be able to show up all the other plant people because you are a plant person part of the gardening in canada crew and the reason i say that is because i'm going to introduce you to new terminology throughout this entire series and i'm hoping you take that terminology and start using it in your conversations when you talk about plants so i'm going to try to break the mainstream or correct the mainstream verbiage on some stuff and try to inject some science into the mix. Today we're talking about nitrogen, obviously. Who, like, could you not have guessed that? Obviously. Well, the thumbnail probably gave it away and the title, but besides that, we're talking about nitrogen today. And nitrogen is commonly referred to in the YouTube blog world as a macronutrient but I'm here to change that narrative. And I know I'm guilty of this too, only because I want to communicate information to you in a digestible fashion. And because you use macronutrient verbiage already, it just makes sense to continue with that, but I'm going to change it. 
It's considered a primary macronutrient. So macronutrients with plants can be broken into two groups, primary and secondary. Primary being the ones we need the absolute most of. Secondary macro, important, but we don't need as much in our soil solution. And then micro is like we barely need any at all. So this is a primary macronutrient, not just a macronutrient, a primary macronutrient for any sort of plant growth. So why is it so important to the plant? Well, it's part of two parts of the plant, the protoplasm and the chlorophyll in particular. So chlorophyll, if you did not know, is what gives a plant a green looking leaf. In variegated plants where there is white and no green, there's very little chlorophyll or very little nitrogen present. And this is because chlorophyll is crucial to photosynthesis. Without chlorophyll, photosynthesis does not take place. Without nitrogen, photosynthesis does not take place. And then the second one being protoplasm. So funny of a name because it's literally not understood at all really by scientists. It's like a clear translucent bundle of cells that's literally found in all living matter on the face of the planet. But nitrogen is also present in the protoplasm that we have no idea what purpose it serves. But anyways, that is where that is found. So where exactly is nitrogen found in the plant? And this one's kind of boring for nitrogen. The ones in the future are actually gonna be super interesting because nutrients, especially all 17 of them, aren't found throughout the entire plant. However, with nitrogen, it is literally everywhere. Roots, shoots, leaves, and flowers. And the reason for this is because it is highly mobile. That stuff is cruising through the entire plant. So because it's highly mobile, the plant can move nitrogen to the parts of the plant it needs or it indicates as useful for survival. That's why when we have lack of nitrogen in our soil, we will see yellowing leaves, but the yellowing of the leaves will typically happen with our old leaves or our leaves that are closer to the base of our plant. The reason for this is because the plant knows that the new foliage has the best chance of photosynthesis and survival. It is likely to have sustained the least amount of damage and therefore it's gonna send all that extra nitrogen or whatever nitrogen it has left to the newest leaves while starving off the old ones. And that's because it is highly mobile. Now, with that being said, if there's an excess of nitrogen, it can result in really, really rapid growth, which ultimately can leave the plant really susceptible to spider mites, thrips, mealybugs, any sap suckers out there, aphids are going to take advantage of this really nice, malleable leaf material left behind from excess nitrogen. But a little bit more on that later. So what form of nitrogen is the plant taken up in? And this is important. This is gonna be a common theme throughout the entire series. There is only certain forms in which nitrogen can be uptaken. The first one being nitrate, which is NO, so nitrogen, and three oxygens, O3. So that is nitrate, and the other version is ammonium, which is N with four hydrogens around it. Now, I know that sounds super nerdy, but I promise you I'll try to make this as easy to understand as possible because it's important. So I hope you guys have a pen and paper ready because this is where it's gonna start getting super nerdy, but it's gonna explain a lot of what I mean or what I'm saying when I tell you things like, make sure your potting soil is the dirtiest dirt on the planet because you need the microbes there. You need a really moist, microbially active uh, scenario inside that pot in order for a lot of the processes needed to take place to happen, especially if you're using an organic fertilizer. This goes for organic gardeners too. We're gonna talk about here in the next little bit why I talk about having microbial activity and why using organic forms of fertilizer and expecting really miraculous results right off the bat is unattainable because there's a lot that goes into actually making nitrogen that can be uptaken by said plants. So let's jump into the nitrogen cycle, but a really plant heavy version of it. We're gonna skip the grade school version and jump right into the university version of this. So wrap your nerdy plant hats on and let's get into it. So the first way in which nitrogen is brought into the soil is through nitrogen fixation. This can be done in 
a few ways, but two main ones. The first one being nitrogen fixation that can take place by nitrifying the bacteria that's able to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is 78 some percent nitrogen, pulls N2 out of the atmosphere and puts it in the soil. The second way is actually through lightning. <laughs> yes, lightning. So lightning will hit the ground and it actually fixes nitrogen into the soil. Crazy, I know, but it's true. It's actually a pretty big factor in all of it. Now, when it comes to potting soil, we will have some nitrifying bacteria or um, nitrogen fixing bacteria, I should say, not nitrifying, that's a different type of bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria. So that nitrogen fixing bacteria in a house plant scenario, there will be some. There's not going to be a ton. In a gardening scenario, you can increase this by intercropping things like alfalfa, just anything from the legume family, uh, peas, beans, you name it. Anything in the legume family can be intercropped with your other plants and that will nitrogen fix for you. And they're actually pretty good at it. You can use inoculants to help increase the nitrogen input from N2, but if you choose to use inoculants, you do need to make sure you don't have an excess of nitrogen in your soil system overall, because if you do have an excess, you will not get as much nitrifying or nitrogen fixing happening because there's an excess. So the plant doesn't call on those other microbes to do the work for them. So the second mechanism in which nitrogen is added to the soil is through ammoniafication. <laughs> Very fancy word for shit on top of the dirt, literally. So this is in the form of vericompost, compost, manure, literally anything. Organic matter in general, and in a lot of cases, just organic fertilizers in general, is adding nitrogen to the soil through ammoniification. Ammonification, ammonification. So the nitrogen is added in the form of NH3. Nitrogen is added in the form of NH4, which we discussed before, is ammonium, which is technically bioavailable to a degree to plants. It has to be in a very certain circumstances, which we'll talk about later, but there is some decomposition, um, not even decomposition, but actual uh, chemical changes that need to take place to that ammonium to turn it into nitrate. So the next form would be obviously fertilizer. Now we're gonna talk about this just a little bit later in more depth, but the form that your nitrogen is put in is going to heavily determine how bioavailable it is and kind of what microbial processes have to take place in order for it to become bioavailable. So if it doesn't state what type of nitrogen is in the mix, it's likely ammonium because it's probably organic additive. So it's in the form of organic material. So a lot of processes need to take place, which we'll discuss. But if it's say a urea, for example, our urea fertilizer, there is still some breakdown that needs to take place. And that is a conventional version of a fertilizer is urea. And so some process, needs to take place in order to make that bioavailable for the plant. So after our nitrogen fixes, our nitrogen fixing bacteria fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere and injects it into the soil, it makes something we call ammonia. So this is very similar to ammonium, but it's missing a hydrogen. So it only has three hydrogens and it's valence electrons. And this is an issue because that means it's very unstable. And this is actually what I do for work is I deal with anhydrous ammonia which is a type of fertilizer that is ammonia in a gas form or a liquid form in some cases. So when this is added, it has a very high affinity for that extra water or that extra hydrogen. And it wants to turn into ammonium really, really badly. So if we have nitrogen fixing happening and our soil is very dry, the nitrogen will be fixed, but it very quickly will be volatilized into the atmosphere, which will have a higher level of moisture content because it's looking for that extra hydrogen. However, if nitrogen fixing or the application of anhydrous ammonia takes place in a damp soil, that nitrogen is immediately brought into that soil profile and held in suspension under the presence of really high hydrogen or H2O in this case, water content within that soil profile. 
So the nice thing about ammonium in general, whether it be applied through manures or through nitrogen fixing or from lightning, is that it is very good at um, staying within the soil system. So even if we have like a really waterlogged soil, a concern is the levelization, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but when it's in the form of NH4 ammonium, it's very stable and therefore it's not gassed off as easily. And it just kind of sits there until it is used, until the excess nitrogen or the excess water is released from the system. So whether you have NH4 or NH3, both of these systems now go through a process called nitrifying or nitrification. And this is the process in which the hydrogens are knocked off and an oxygen or several oxygens are replaced with it to cause a nitrite, trite, not yet a nitrate, which is the bioavailable form, but nitrite. So this is NO2. There's only two oxygens and it really wants that third one. So nitrite is not a bioavailable form of nitrogen for plants and therefore it's kind of in limbo hanging out there. So we've made the jump from NH3, NH4 to NO2, and now we have to nitrify into NO3, which is the official version in which plants can uptake it, the, the nitrogen. So the nitrifying bacteria is going to then change the NO2 to an NO3. So it's gonna pop an extra oxygen on, and voila, it can now be something called a simulated, it's called a simulation when the plant takes the actual nitrogen up into the plant, it can be uptaken once it ends in that NO3 or nitrate phase. So you can see there's quite a few jumps that need to take place, quite a bit of decomposition that can take place, and factors such as moisture content, um, temperature, the container size, are all going to affect the speed in which this happens. Waterlogged soils, it's going to stay in that NH4 um, kind of situation a little bit longer, but overall, this is kind of what we're looking for or what needs to take place both in a house plant scenario and an outdoor plant scenario. So, assimilation um, in general, once it's kind of taken in by the plants, it's then eaten by obviously animals in many cases and then put out as N2, which then turns into NH4 and etc and so forth. So the whole process restarts again, or if we compost it, whatever, the whole process restarts again. Now there is an issue with nitrate, is the, the bioavailable form, and that is that it is very easily, it's a form of nitrogen that is very easily lost from the soil system. It's like a double-edged sword. So leaching is a process that takes place not when necessarily the water is um, logged, when the soil is logged with water, it's from the physical flow of water. So it's from when water flows through. And if you guys grabbed my um, sign up, or if you signed up for the newsletter recently, I did include a free printable that comes with it now, and it has how to water basically containers or house plants in general. And in that, what I'm trying to get you to do is I'm trying to get you to leach out that excess nitrate that is the bioavailable form of nitrogen. You're probably thinking, why are you making me waste my money? Why are you making me wash my nitrogen down the sink? And it's because if you leave too much nitrogen present, there's a whole host of factors such as increase in pH actually, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, but you can have um, an excess of new foliage growth. And that excess of new foliage growth is dangerous because it leaves the new leaves, because it's highly mobile, remember, it leaves those new leaves really susceptible to being eaten by bugs. So I'm telling you to leach it out because we don't want excess, we don't want to over fertilize. And so leaching is the process of the water running through the soil profile and out through the bottom. Leaching is more prevalent and happens more often or, or more likely to have a low nitrogen content or a lack of nitrogen in very coarse soils. So people who do the orchid bark, sphagnum moss, peat moss, pumice mix, like that really aeroid mix that um, is really, really airy. I've seen lots of plant people do this. 
that has really high levels of leaching so you really need to make sure you're fertilizing on actually probably you want to fertilize at full strength throughout the entire year no matter what and every time you water you want to fertilize at full strength because your ability to hold nitrogen is low and then once you water it's leached right out of the system it's very very quick in doing so so just something to keep in mind the second mechanism for loss is actually denitrification so it's the process in which nitrate is denitrified so it's taken from a bioavailable form to a non bioavailable form and this generally will happen if the soil is waterlogged and I mean not moist not wet but logged like meaning you can squish it and water pools this will start to happen if the water has been in that system in excess for two to three days. So gardeners in the spring, when you're noticing water, the, the soil has thawed out. If the soil is warm and your soil has been logged for two to three days or you get a heavy downpour and flooding in the summer and it's logged for two or three days, a lot of or nitrogen, nitrate, that was bioavailable to the plant, is being denitrified. And so you actually have a huge loss in nitrogen. But like I said, NH4, ammonium, is completely safe from this process because it has not yet been nitrified. So the bacteria has not nitrified it into nitrate yet. So one of the most significant ways to lose nitrogen is also called volatilization. And this is very specific to top dressers. So this is the no dig people, um, people who are doing um, just like top dressing mulching kind of with a compost or a manure. If you're top dressing your house plants, for example, that exposure to air um, and the fact that it's kind of the surface of the soil now means it's very likely that volatilization will take place and what this is it's 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 just the gassing off of ammonia so it's the NH3 process it's gassing things off and this is really common actually with urea so with the compost the manures urea is one of the main forms of nitrogen in that soil system and there's nothing wrong with this um, it's perfectly fine but the issue is that it does gas off so you can have what you thought you applied may not be what's actually available months down the road because you have had a gassing off process. Now, when you use an urea fertilizer conventionally and you top dress again or you broadcast would be the, the proper way of saying that, such as your lawn, for example, again, you're going to have a labelization. You're going to have a certain amount of loss through the process of gassing off. And the reason for this is because urea is ammonia. So it's that unstable NH3 form. So as it's being decomposed or it's being um, brought into the soil system into the form of NH4, a gas off can happen, especially in really high heat conditions, high moisture conditions, things of that nature. So this next point is for all the houseplant people and the container gardeners. You absolutely must listen to this because this is so important. So there's an electric balance that needs to be maintained both in the root and the soil system. So for every positively charged ion that is uptaken, a positively charged ion has to be left behind in the soil. For every negatively charged ion that is uptaken into the plant, a negatively charged ion has to be left into the soil. This means if the plant is taking up nitrogen in the form of ammonium, so that's the NH4, a hydrogen ion has to be lost and left in the soil. Similarly, when a nitrate is taken up into the plant, a whole compound <laughs> is left behind which is called hydrogen carbon trioxide, or also known as bicarbonate, bicarbonate. So what does this mean? And this is important. So if you're using a urea-based fertilizer or an organic form of fertilizer with your house plants or in your container garden specifically, this goes for the outdoor gardeners too, but because we're in such a big open system when we outdoor garden, it's not you know as detrimental However, it can affect ultimately some stuff, especially if you're in a raised bed garden. 
you're changing your pH. And if you have a small little system, such as a potting soil or a potted plant, you're releasing a hydrogen every single time your urea is taken into your plant. And so that means your pH is going up, 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 up. And when we've talked about this before, I've mentioned pH is key to nitrogen or nutrient uptake in general. And the plant must be within a designated range specific to that plant. Now, overall, you know, consensus is 5.5 to 6.5 pH, give or take a couple points off of there. Most plants are okay with that. But if we're using a urea fertilizer, an organic fertilizer, we're releasing a lot of hydrogens into our soil, which ultimately is slowly acidifying, acidification of our soil. So we're slowly making our soil more and more acidic. So we're dropping our pH lower and lower. So again, another great reason to follow the uh, watering document I made, but you wanna flush the soil to remove those excess hydrogens, which ultimately can negatively impact your plant. Now, if you're using a nitrate version of for, um, a fertilizer and you're getting this bicarbonate release, you're actually doing the opposite. <laughs> so you're alkalizing your soil. So you are removing technically hydrogens because it is combining with the carbonate, the nate on it, the CO3. It's making a molecule and that molecule needs a hydrogen to be stable. So it's pulling hydrogens out of the soil and putting them inside of the bicarbonate. And so what ends up happening there is you end up with a more alkaline soil. So you're pushing above seven. And again, this is detrimental to the plant because this change in pH can affect our nutrient or uptake just in general. So just something to keep in mind, regardless of whatever fertilizer you're using, fertilizer is fertilizer, <laughs> nutrients is nutrients. Um, this is kind of where like the organic thing versus conventional just like breaks my brain because at the end of the day, the plant doesn't care where the nitrogen source or any nutrient source came from, it just cares that it's in the right format. And both versions of nutrients, conventional or organic, are both going to alkalize or acidify the soil based on whatever the component that was applied is put in. So the fun fact there. So if you have a small volume of soil and you're using a fertilizer, which I hope you are, just keep in mind your pH can change. It's something that you may want to either measure or check for, and then simultaneously repot or change that medium or flush that medium on a regular basis in hopes of removing that uh, bicarbonate or the excess hydrogen ions, which I mean, can work to a point, but you're obviously limited in some circumstances as well. So this next one is for all the gardeners out there and I'm about to break your brains because uh, blossom end rots is like kind of one of those things that just drives me insane. There's so much misinformation as to what's even going on when this happens. But anyways, I'm gonna give you one scenario in which blossom end rot happens and it has to do with nitrogen actually. Surprisingly. So the use of organic um, fertilizers is a double-edged sword. And so with organic fertilizers, you can, in a lot of cases, end up with blossom end rot. And the reason for this is because the form of nitrogen added is ammonium, which is the NH4. And NH4 is a replacement for nitrate in the soil system, which is in direct competition with potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So NH4 is in direct cation competition with those other three mechanisms, which all of which are, you know, causes for blossom end rot. So if you're using organic fertilizers, you really, really need to watch how much you're applying. You cannot just dump this stuff on because over time you will have increased levels of blossom end rot. The reason for this is because, like I said, in the soil system and in the root system in general, that NH4 is in direct competition with calcium, magnesium, and potassium. And what ends up happening is because it's battling out sites to hang out in, nitrate, or sorry, 
ammonium NH4 is winning every time because it is a nitrogen with like four bodyguards on it. So it's just gonna kick out all these single molecules because they're weak and insignificant. They don't have the bodyguard, you know, they don't have the entourage with them. So they end up getting booted out. So your plant in general is going to look like it's growing very, very nicely. It's gonna be very happy. But in reality, it's missing three very key components because those three components have just been eliminated from being absorbed at all. So I would suspect a lot of cases of blossom and rot um, <laughs> have a lot to do with the fact that folks are fertilizing with the best intent, but in reality, they're over applying nitrogen and it's occupying much needed interactions for those other molecules to take place. That is all I have for you guys on nitrogen. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments down below what you learned, what is new to you, what you never realized was a thing when it came to nitrogen. Like I said, this is day one of 17 days. And I don't think like they're not all going to be this long, but these primary nutrients are going to be long. They're going to be catastrophically long only because there's so much information that you guys need to know. I hope you enjoyed this series. I'm literally going to be here every single day until Christmas. This is my Christmas present to you guys. And if you are still watching, stop lurking, hit that subscribe button. I know you want to join our awesome crew of people and uh, stay warm. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.